There is a fifth dimension, beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space, and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. We look at a sign which reads Maple Street. It's a tree-lined, quiet, residential American street, very typical of a small town. The houses have front porches on which people sit and swing on gliders, conversing across from house to house. Steve Brand polishes his car parked in front of his house. His neighbor, Don Martin, leans against the fender watching him. A good-humored man rides a bicycle and is just in the process of stopping to sell some ice cream to a couple of kids. Two women gossip on the front lawn. Another man waters his lawn. Maple Street, USA. Late summer. A tree-lined little world of front porch gliders, hopscotch, the laughter of children, and the bell of an ice cream vendor. At the sound of the roar and the flash of light, it will be precisely 6.43 p.m. on Maple Street. At this moment, one of the little boys, Tommy, looks up to listen to a sound of a tremendous screeching roar from overhead. A flash of light plays on both their faces, and then it moves down the street, past lawns and porches and rooftops, and then disappears. Various people leave their porches and stop what they're doing to stare up at the sky. Steve Brand, the man who's been polishing his car, now he stands there, transfixed, staring upwards. He looks at Don Martin, his neighbor from across the street. What was that? A meteor? That's what it looked like. I didn't hear any crash, though. Did you? Nope. I didn't hear anything except a roar. Steve, what was that? Guess it was a meteor, honey. Came awful close, didn't it? It's a bus for my money, must be a bus. Maple Street, 6.44 p.m. on a late September evening. Maple Street, in the last calm and reflective moments before the monsters came. We slowly began across the porches again. We see a man screwing a light bulb on a front porch. Then, getting down off the stool to flick the switch, and finding that nothing happens. Another man is working on an electric power mower. He plugs in the plug, flicks on the switch of the power mower, off and on, nothing happening. Through the window of a front porch, we see a woman pushing her finger back and forth on the dial room. Her voice is indistinct and distant, but intelligible and repetitive. Operator? Operator? Something's wrong with the phone. Uh, operator, Steve, the power's off. I have the soup on the stove and the stove just stopped working. Same thing over here. Uh, I can't get anybody on the phone either. The phone seems to be dead. We look down the street as we hear the voices creep up from down below. Small, mildly disturbed voices highlighted these kinds of phrases. Electricity's off. Can't work. get a thing on the radio. Uh, we're going boom. Radio's not dead. All. Pete Van Horn. A tall, thin man is seen standing in front of his house. I'll cut through the backyard. See if the power is still on on Floral Street. I'll be right back. He walks past the side of his house and disappears into the backyard. There is a hammer on Van Horn's hip as he walks. We look around slowly until we're looking at 10 or 11 people standing around the street and overflow into the curb and sidewalk. In the background is Steve Brand's car. Doesn't make any sense. Why should the power go off all of a sudden and the phone line? Maybe some sort of an electrical storm or something? That don't seem likely. Sky's just as blue as anything. Not a cloud, no lightning. No thunder, no nothing. How could it be a storm? I can't get a thing on the radio. Not even the portable. <laughs> well, why don't you go downtown and check with the police? Though they'll probably think we're crazy or something. A little power failure, and right away we all get flustered and everything. It isn't just a power failure, Charlie. If it was, we'd still be able to get a broadcast on the portable. I'll run downtown. We'll get this all straightened out. He walks over to the car, gets in it, turns the key. Beyond it, we see the crowd watching him from the other side. Steve starts the engine. It turns over, sluggishly, and then just stops dead. He tries it again, and this time he can't get it to turn over. Then, very slowly and reflectively, he turns the key back to off, and then slowly gets out of the car. As they stare at Steve, he stands for a moment by the car, 
then walks toward the group. I don't understand it. It was working fine before. Out of gas? I just had it filled up. What's it mean? It's just as if... as if everything had stopped. We'd better walk downtown. The two of us can go, Charlie. It couldn't be the meteor. The meteor couldn't do this. He and Charlie exchange a look. Then, they start to walk away from the group. We see Tommy, a serious-faced 14-year-old in spectacles who stands a few feet away from the group. Halfway between them and the two men who start to walk down the sidewalk. Mr. Brand? You better not. Why not? They don't want you to. Who doesn't want us to? Them! Who are them? Whoever was in that thing that came by overhead. What? Whoever was in that thing that came over. I don't think they want us to leave here. Steve leaves Charlie and walks over to the boy. He kneels down in front of him. He forces his voice to remain gentle. He reaches out and holds the boy. What do you mean? What are you talking about? They don't want us to leave. That's why they shut everything off. What makes you say that? Whatever gave you that idea? Now isn't that the craziest thing you ever heard? It's always that way. In every story I ever read about a ship landing from outer space. Uh, From outer space yet, Sally, you better get that boy of yours up to bed. He's been reading too many comic books or seeing too many movies or something. Tommy, come over here and stop that kind of talk. Go ahead, Tommy. We'll be right back. And you'll see. That wasn't any ship or anything like that. That was was just a meteor or something. Likely as He turns to the group. Now trying to weight his words with an optimism he obviously doesn't feel, but is desperately trying to instill in himself, as well as the others. No doubt it did have something to do with all this power failure and the rest of it. Meteors can do some crazy things, like, uh, like sunspots. Sure, that, that's the kind of thing. Like sunspots. They raise king with radio reception all over the world. And this thing being so close... Why, there's no telling the sort of stuff it can do. Go ahead, Charlie. You and Steve go into town and see if that isn't what's causing it all. Steve and Charlie, again, walk away from the group down the sidewalk. The people watch silently. Tommy stares at them, biting his lips and finally calling out again, Mr. Brand! The two men stop again. Tommy takes a step toward them. Mr. Brand, please don't leave here. Steve and Charlie can be seen beyond them. They stop once again, and turn toward the boy. There's a murmur in the crowd, a murmur of irritation and concern, as if the boy were bringing up fears that shouldn't be brought up, words which carried with them a strange kind of validity that came without logic, but nonetheless registered and had meaning and effect. Again, the murmur of reaction from the crowd. Tommy is partly frightened and partly defiant as well. You might not even be able to get to town. It was that way in the story. Nobody could leave. Nobody except... Except who? Except the people they'd sent out ahead of them. They looked just like humans. And it wasn't until the ship landed that... Tommy, please, son, honey, don't talk that way. (laughs) That kid shouldn't talk that way, and we shouldn't stand here listening to him. Why, this is the craziest thing I ever heard of. The kid tells us a comic book plot, and here we stand listening. Go ahead, Tommy. What kind of story was this? What about the people that they sent out ahead? That was the way they prepared things for the landing. They sent four people, a mother and a father, and two kids who looked just like humans. But they weren't. There's another silence as Steve looks toward the crowd, then toward Tom. He wears a tight grin. Well, I guess what we'd better do then is to... Run a check on the neighborhood and see which one of us are really human. There's laughter at this, but it's a laughter that comes from a desperate attempt to lighten the atmosphere. It's a release kind of laugh. The people look at one another in the middle of their laughter. There there must be something better to do than stand around making bum jokes about it. Uh, I wonder if Floral Street's got the same deal we got. Where's Pete Van Horn anyway? Didn't he get back yet? There's the sound of a car's engine starting to turn over. We look across the street toward the driveway of Les Goodwin's house. He's at the wheel trying to start the car. Can you get it started, Les? 
No dice. He walks toward the group. He stops, suddenly, as behind him, inexplicably, and with a noise that inserts itself into the silence, the car engine starts up all by itself. Goodman whirls around and stare toward it. The car idles roughly, smoke coming from the exhaust, the frame shaking gently. Goodman's eyes go wide, and he runs over to his car. The people stare at the car. He got the car started somehow. He, he got his car started. The people stare, somehow caught up by this revelation, and somehow, illogically, wildly frightened. How come his car just had been started like that? All by itself. He wasn't anywhere near it. It started all by itself. And he never did come out to look at that thing that flew overhead. He wasn't even interested. Why? Why didn't he come out with the rest of us to look? He always was an oddball. Him and his whole family. Real oddball. What do you say we ask him? The group suddenly starts toward the house. In this brief fraction of a moment, they take the first step toward performing a metamorphosis that changes people from a group into a mob. They begin to head purposefully across the street toward the house at the end. Steve stands in front of them. For a moment, their fear almost turns their walk into a wild stampede. But Steve's voice, loud, incisive, and commanding, makes them stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! Let's not be a mob. The people stop as a group, seem to pause for a moment, and then, much more quietly and slowly, start to walk across the street. Goodman stands there alone, facing the people. I just don't understand it. I tried to start it and it wouldn't start. You saw me. All of you saw me. And now, just as suddenly as the engine started, it stops. And there's a long silence that is gradually intruded upon by the frightened murmuring of the people. I, I don't understand. I swear I don't understand. What's happening? Maybe you better tell us. Nothing's working on this street. Nothing. No lights. No power. No radio. Nothing except one car. Yours. The people pick this up, and now their murmuring becomes a loud chant, filling the air with accusations and demands for action. Two of the men passed on, and head toward Goodman, who backs away, backing into his car, and now at bay. Wait a minute now, you keep your distance, all of you. So I've got a car that starts by itself. Well, that's a free thing, I admit it, but does that make me some kind of criminal or something? I don't know why the car works, it just does. This stops the crowd momentarily, and now Goodman, still backing away, goes toward his front porch. He goes up the steps and then stops to stand facing the mob. We see Steve as he comes through the crowd. We're all on a monster kick, Les. Seems that the general impression holds that maybe one family isn't what we think they are. Monsters from outer space or something different than us. Fifth columnist from the vast beyond. Do you know anybody that might fit that description out here on Maple Street? What is this, a gag or something? Is this a practical joke or something? We see a close-up of a porch light that suddenly goes out. There's a murmur from the group. Now I suppose that's supposed to incriminate me. The light goes on and off. That really does it, doesn't it? I just don't understand this. Look, you all know me. We've lived here five years, right in this house. We're no different than any of the rest of you. We're no different at all. Really, this whole thing is just... just weird. Well, if that's the case, Les Goodman, explain what... Explain what? Look, let's forget this. Go ahead, let her talk. What about it? Explain what? Well, sometimes I go to bed late at night. A couple of times. A couple of times I'd come out on the porch and I'd see Mr. Goodman here in the wee hours of the morning, standing out in front of his house, looking up at the sky. That's right. Looking up at the sky as if, as if he were waiting for something. As if he were looking. There's a murmur of reaction from the crowd again. As Goodman starts toward them, they back away, frightened. You know, really, this is for laughs. You know what I'm guilty of? I'm guilty of insomnia. You know, what's the penalty for insomnia? Did you hear what I said? I said it was insomnia. I said it was insomnia. You fools. You scared, frightened rabbits. You. You're sick people. Do you know that? You're sick people, all of you. And you don't even know what you're starting because let me tell you, let me tell you, this thing that you're starting, that should frighten you. As God is my witness, you're letting something begin here that's a nightmare. 
We see the Goodman entry hall at night. On the side table rests an unlit candle. Mrs. Goodman walks in, a glass of milk in hand. She sets the milk down on the table, lights the candle with the match from the box on the table, picks up the glass of milk, and walks out of the room. Mrs. Goodman comes through her front porch, glass of milk in hand. Outside, she sees little knots of people who stand around talking in low voices. At the end of each conversation, they look toward Les Goodman's house. From the various houses, we can see candlelight but no electricity, and there's an all-pervading quiet that blankets the whole area, disturbed only by the almost whispered voices of the people as they stand around. In one group, Charlie stands. He stares across at Goodman's house. Two men stand across the street in almost sentry-like poses. It, it just doesn't seem right, though. It doesn't. Keeping watch on him? Why? He was right when he said he was one of our neighbors. Why, I've known Ethel Goodman ever since they moved in. We've been good friends. That ever. don't prove a thing. Any guy who'd spend his time looking up at the sky early in the morning, well, there's something wrong with that kind of person. There's something that ain't legitimate. Maybe under normal circumstances we could let it go by, but these aren't normal circumstances. Why, well, look at this street. Nothing but candles. It's like going back into the dark ages or something. From several yards down, as Steve walks down the steps of his porch, walks down the street over to Les Goodman's house, and then stops at the foot of the steps. Goodman stands there, his wife behind him, very frightened. Just stay right where you are, Steve. We don't want any trouble, but this time anybody sets foot on my porch, that's what they're going to get. Trouble. Look, Les- I've already explained to you people. I don't sleep well at night sometimes. I get up, and I take a walk, and I look up at the sky. I look at the stars. That's exactly what he does, but- why, this whole thing, it's, it's some kind of madness or something. That's exactly what it is. Some kind of madness. You best who, watch who you're seen with, Steve. Until we get all this straightened out, you ain't exactly above suspicion yourself. Or you, Charlie, or any of us, it seems. From age eight on up. What I'd like to know is, what are we going to do? Just stand around here all night? There's nothing else we can do. One of them will tip their hand. They got to. There's something you can do, Charlie. You could go home and keep your mouth shut. You could quit strutting around like a self-appointed hanging judge and just climb into bed and forget about it. You sound real anxious to have that happen, Steve. I think we better keep our eye on you, too. I, I think everything might as well come out now. Your wife's done plenty of talking, Steve, about how odd you are. Go ahead. Tell us what she said. Go ahead. What's my wife said? Let's get it all out. Let's pick out every idiosyncrasy of every single man, woman, and child on the street. And then we might as well set up some kind of a kangaroo court. How about a firing squad at dawn, Charlie, so we can get rid of all the suspects? Narrow them down. Make it easier for you. There's no need getting so upset, Steve. It's just that, well... Myra's talked about how there's been plenty of nights you spent hours down in your basement working on some kind of radio or something. Well, none of us have ever seen that radio. Go ahead, Steve. What kind of radio set are you working on? I've never seen it. Neither has anyone else. Who do you talk to on that radio set? And who talks to you? I'm surprised at you, Charlie. How come you're so dense all of a sudden? <laughs> who do I talk to? I talk to monsters from outer space. I talk to three-headed green men who fly over here in what look like meteors. Steve, Steve, please. It's it's just a ham radio set. That's all. I, I bought him a book on it myself. It's just a ham radio set of a lot of people. Have them. I can show it to you. It, it's right down in the basement. Show them nothing. If they want to look inside our house, let them get a search warrant. Look, buddy, you can't afford Charlie, to. don't tell me what I can't afford. And stop telling me who's dangerous and who isn't and who's safe and who's a menace. And you're with him too. All of you. You're standing here all set to crucify, all set to find a scapegoat, all desperate to point out some kind of a finger at a neighbor. Well, now look, friends. The only thing that's going to happen is that we'll eat each other up alive. That's not the only thing that can happen to us. A figure has materialized in the gloom. And in the silence, we can hear the clickety-clack of slow, measured footsteps on concrete as the figure walks slowly toward them. One of the women lets out a stifled cry. <gasps> the young mother grabs her boy as to a couple of others. It's the monster! It's the monster! It's the monster! Another woman lets out a wail, <gasps> and the people fall back in a group, staring toward the darkness and the approaching figure. People stand in the shadows, watching. Don Martin joins them, carrying a shotgun. He holds it up. We may need this. A shotgun? Good lord, will anybody think a thought around here? Will you people wise up? 
Well, do what a shotgun do again. No more talk, Steve. You're going to talk us into a grave. You'd let whatever's out there walk right over us, wouldn't you? Well, some of us won't. He swings the gun around to point it toward the sidewalk. The dark figure continues to walk toward them. The group there, fearful, apprehensive, mothers clutching children, men standing in front of wives. Charlie slowly raises the gun. As the figure gets closer and closer, he suddenly pulls the trigger. The sound of it explodes in the stillness. The figure suddenly lets out a small cry, oh. stumbles forward onto his knees, and then falls forward on his face. Don, Charlie, and Steve race forward over to him. Steve is there first and turns the man over. Now the crowd gathers around them. It's Pete Van Horn. Pete Van Horn? He was just going to go over to the next block to see if the power was on. You killed him, Charlie. You shot him dead. But, but I didn't know who he was. I, I certainly didn't know who he was. He comes walking out of the darkness. How am I supposed to know who he was? Steve, you know why I shot. How was I supposed to know he wasn't a monster or something? We're all scared of the same thing. I was just trying to, trying to protect my home, that's all. Look, all of you, that's all I was trying to do. I didn't know it was somebody we knew. I didn't know. There's a sudden hush <sighs> and then an intake of breath. Suddenly, everyone looks over to Charlie's house as the house lights come on. Charlie? Charlie, the lights just went on in your house. Why did the lights just go on? What about it, Charlie? How come you're the only one with lights now? That's what I'd like to know. You were so quick to kill Charlie, and you were so quick to tell us who we had to be careful of. Well, maybe you had to kill. Maybe Peter there was trying to tell us something. Maybe he found out something and came back to tell us who there was amongst us we should out watch out for. No, no, it's nothing of the sort. I don't know why the lights are on. I swear I don't. Somebody's pulling a gag or something. A gag? A gag? Charlie, there's a dead man on the sidewalk, and you killed him. Does this look like a gag to you? No, no, please. Charlie breaks away from the group and runs toward his house. A man breaks away from the crowd and chases Charlie. As the man tackles him and lands on top of him, the other people start to run toward him. Charlie is up on his feet, breaks away from the other man's grasp, lands a couple of desperate punches to push the man aside. Then, he forces his way, fighting through the crowd to once again break free, jumps on his front porch. On the front porch is a rock is thrown from the group, snatches a window alongside of him, the broken glass flying past him, a couple of pieces cutting him. He stands there perspiring, rumpled, blood running down from a cut on the cheek. His wife breaks away from the group to throw herself into his arms. He buries his face against her. We can see the crowd converging on the porch now. It must have He's been the one. We've got to get Charlie. Another rock lands on the porch. Now Charlie pushes his wife behind him, facing the group. Look, look, I swear to you, it isn't me. But, but I do know who it is. I swear to you, I do know who it is. I know who it is that the monster is here. I know who it is that doesn't belong. I swear to you, I know. What are you waiting for? Come on, Charlie, come on. Who is it, Charlie? Tell us. All right, Charlie, let's hear it. It's, it's, go ahead, Charlie, tell us. It's, it's the kid. It's Tommy. He's the one. <laughs> There's a gasp from the crowd as we cut to a shot of Sally holding her son, Tommy. The boy at first doesn't understand, and then realizing the eyes are all on him, buries his face against his mother. That's crazy. That's crazy. He's just a little boy. But he knew. He was the only one who knew. He told us all about it. Well, how did he know? How could he have known? How could he know? Who told Make him? the kid answer. What about Goodman's car? It was Charlie who killed old man Van Horn. But it was the kid here who knew what was going to happen the whole time. He was the one who knew. Have you all gone crazy? Stop. Charlie has to be the one. Where's my rifle? Les Goodman's the one. His car started. Let's wreck it. What about Steve's radio? He's the one that called them. Smash the radio. Get me a hammer. Get me something. Stop. Stop. Where's the kid? Let's get him. Get Steve. Get Charlie. They're working together. The crowd starts to converge around the mother, who grabs the child and starts to run with him. The crowd starts to follow at first, walking fast, and then running after him. We see a full shot of the street as suddenly Charlie's lights go off and the lights in another house go on. They stay on for a moment, then from across the street, other lights go on and then off again. It isn't the kid. It's Bob Weaver's house. It isn't house. Bob Weaver's house. It's John Martin's place. I tell you it's the kid. It's Charlie, he's the one. We move to a series of close-ups of various people as they shout, accuse, scream, intersperse in these shots with shots of houses as the lights go on and off. And then slowly, in the middle of this nightmarish morass of a sight and sound, we start to pull away until we once again reach the opening shot looking at the Maple Street sign from high above. We continue to move away until we dissolve to a shot looking toward a metal spacecraft, which sits shrouded in darkness. An open door throws out a beam of light from the illuminated interior. Two figures silhouetted against the bright lights appear. We only get a vague feeling of form, but nothing more explicit than that.
understand the procedure now? Just stop a few of their machines and radios and telephones and lawnmowers. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. And then you just sit back and watch the pattern. And this pattern, it is always the same, with few variations. They pick the most dangerous enemy they can find, and it's themselves. And all we need to do is sit back and watch. Then I take it this place, this Maple Street, it is not unique. <laughs> By no means. Their world is full of Maple Streets and we'll go from one to the other and let them destroy themselves. One to the other, one to the other, one to the other. The tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallout. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill, and suspicion can destroy. And a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all of its own for the children, the children yet unborn. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone, the monsters are due on Maple Street, starring Reed Locke as the narrator and sage directions, Michael Maloney as Steve Brand, Caitlin Vincent as Don Martin, Katie Sparts as Charlie, Tara Ampolini as Les Goodman and Pete Van Horn, Grace Patterson as Mrs. Brand, Mrs. Goodman, and Woman, Mia Georgiana as Tommy, Man 2, and Figure 1, Riley Hamburg as Sally, Man 1, and Figure 2, Emily Robinette as Various Background Noises, Directed by Sydney Thomas, Audio Engineered by Grace Patterson, Edited by Emily Robinette and Grace Patterson, Written by Rod Sterling. Thank you to the Tulane University Theater Department, especially our advisor, Victor Holtke. This performance brought to you by Tulane University Performing Arts Society.